Well, welcome back for our final session today. I, was, I expected you to say, oh. <laughs> good, good, thank you. <laughs> All right, let's go back to our uh, study notes, page 168. And I'm going to review what we studied at the very end of our last session together. Um, verse 1 reads as follows, The fifth angel sounded his trumpet, and I saw a star that had fallen from heaven, from the sky to the earth. The star was given the key to the shaft of the abyss. Now, uh, there are several things that we noticed here. One is the divine passage, right? God is allowing this to happen. In other words, God is in control. Also, we noticed that uh, even though the King James Version says that he saw a star fall from heaven, really the tense of the verb is that the star had fallen from heaven. And who is that star that had fallen from heaven? It is Lucifer, who is mentioned in Isaiah chapter 14. Then we went to uh, the comments on verse 2. It says, And he opened the bottomless pit, with the key that is, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. So when uh, the pit is opened with the key, there is a deep darkness, isn't there? According to this. And we notice also that uh, the, the star is a he, right? It's not an it, it's a he. And uh, only, uh, you know, most of, of the trumpets, it says that a third was affected. Here, there's no mention of a third. So this must be an overwhelming and total darkness wherever it falls. Now let's go to verse 3. Then out of the smoke, locusts came up upon the earth. And to them was given power, notice once again, was given power. Who is really in control here? Who is really uh, allowing these things to happen? It's God who is allowing them to happen. And to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. So now we have not only locusts, but we have what? Scorpions. The locusts are really scorpions. Now, when the shaft of the abyss opens, all hell breaks loose. As we have previously seen, when we studied the fourth trumpet, the sun, which is the greater light, the moon, which is the lesser light, representing Christ and the scriptures, and the stars, which represent God's people, were partially eclipsed. There was partial darkness during the fourth trumpet. But it appears that in the fifth trumpet, the darkness is much deeper than the darkness that uh, was there during the period of the fourth trumpet. Now, uh, let's read Exodus chapter 10 and verse 15, where we find a very interesting detail. You, when you read Exodus 10 verse 15, which speaks about the plague of locusts that fell upon Egypt, uh, the impression that you get is that the cloud that comes from the abyss and darkens everything is really the cloud of locusts. So notice what we find in Exodus 10 and verse 15. For they, that is the locusts in Egypt, covered the face of the whole earth, so that the land was what? Darkened. So what, what is it that caused the darkness under the fifth trumpet? It is the, the, the host of locusts that come up, that, that are related also to scorpions. And it says, uh, this is in Egypt, and they ate every herb of the land, this is, of course, literal, and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. So there remained nothing green on the trees or on the plants of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. So what is it that caused the darkness in the fifth trumpet? It's the locusts are so pervasive, there's so many of them that they totally cover the sun and the moon. There's, there's no light on the earth. France... Now here comes the application from the spirit of prophecy. France had the bright light of the Reformation and rejected that light. And the result was what? Great darkness. Notice Testimonies, Volume 1, page 232. I saw that the greater the light, 
which people reject, the greater will be what? The power of deception and darkness which will come upon them. The rejection of truth leaves men captives. And the subject of whom? The subjects of Satan's deception. Did France reject the light? Yes. It was the one nation that strongly opposed the Reformation. You know, slaughtering so many of the Huguenots during the uh, St. Bartholomew massacre, and so she reaped what she sowed. The words of Jesus that we find in Matthew 6, 22 and 23, are a fit description of how the rejection of the light of the Reformation led to the pitch darkness of the French Revolution. Are you understanding that the darkness intensified between the fourth and the fifth trumpet? At least there's some light during the fourth trumpet. During the fifth trump trumpet, everything on earth is what? Darkened. Matthew 6, 22 and 23. The lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of what? Full of light. But if your eye is bad, that means if you, don't wanna, if you don't want to accept the message, if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of what? Full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So that describes what happens when people reject the light. The darkness becomes ever more intense. Now, the next section, is, uh, I, I believe, is very interesting. In Scripture, God's points of the compass are the north and the east. You read Scripture, the north and the east. When Jesus, here are some examples, when Jesus came the first time, He came by way of what? The rising sun, or the east. Luke 1, 78 and 79. When Jesus went to heaven, that is up, because <laughs> up is north, according to the Scripture. It was by way of the Mount of Olives on which side of Jerusalem? East. On the east side of Jerusalem. The sealing angel comes from where? From the east. When Jesus comes again with His armies, it will be from where? East. From the east. The east is God's point of the compass. Why? Because of the position of the sun. Where does light begin? Light begins in the east, and God is a God of light. Are you following me? That's why God is compared with the sun. Furthermore, according to Isaiah 14, 13 and 14, as well as Psalm 48, verses 1 and 2, God's throne is where? In the sides of the north. In other words, up in heaven. Why? Because the sun reaches, it reaches its brightest intensity when it is directly overhead. For that reason, in Ezekiel 1, when God comes to judge Jerusalem, His chariot comes from the north, according to Ezekiel 1 verse 4, and arrives by way of the east. On the other hand, the west is the place where darkness begins, and the south, or the underworld, is the place where darkness reaches its deepest intensity because it's directly underground. Midnight. The ancients considered the south the realm of the underworld where demons thrive because it was the place of deepest darkness. For this reason, darkness in the fifth trumpet comes from where? It comes from the abyss, which is the underworld. Now let's go to Amos chapter 8 verses 11 and 12 and notice something very interesting, very, very, very interesting. Amos, that's one of the little minor prophets that is not always easy to find. Um, Amos, where are you Amos? <laughs> it's, uh, you know, just to give you a little help, it's right before Obadiah. <laughs> okay, Amos 8, verses 11 and 12. Notice where people go seeking the Word of God. Do they go west and south? 
No, 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 they don't go west and south. Verse 11 says, Behold the days are coming, says the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, and from where to where, and from north to east, they shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but they shall not find it. Because, of course, the door of probation has what? The door of probation has closed. Now, so Amos 8, 11, and 12 tells us that after the close of probation, people will run to the north and the east seeking the word of God, because the word of God is light. Right? Thy word is a light unto my feet, and a lamp, un a lamp unto my feet, and light unto my path. The ancients would never think of going to the west and the south because these directions are the realm of darkness. Darkness begins in the west where the sun sets and it reaches its deepest intensity when it's directly south. That's why Ellen White describes the period of papal dominion as the midnight of the world because the sun is directly south in the underworld. Now you might wonder what the directions of the compass have to do with the fifth trumpet. Say, why do you introduce this about the points of the compass? What's the point? Well, now we're going to the point. Well, Egypt was literally south of Israel, and therefore it was the king of what? The king of the south. By the way, if you want a reference for that, you can go to uh, Daniel 11 verses 8 and 9, where Egypt is identified as the king of the south because Egypt is south of Israel. And the king of the north was Babylon, because Babylon is actually north and east, but in order to arrive in Israel, they couldn't uh, cross the Arabian desert. They had to go up the fertile, across the fertile crescent and come down by way of Lebanon to Jerusalem. So they would come from the north. The Babylonians would come from the north. So Egypt was literally south of Israel, which means that Egypt was the king of what? It was the king of the south. As we will notice later in this study, it is not accidental that Revelation 11 verse 8 refers to the demons that rose from the abyss in the French Revolution with the name what? Egypt. Are you following me or not? Darkness became notorious in Egypt at the time of the 10th plague, didn't it? This is persuasive evidence that there is a connection between the fifth trumpet and the French Revolution described in Revelation 11 verses 7 through 10. Now it's also significant that Daniel 11 verse 40 describes the king of the south rising and attacking the king of the north at the beginning of the time of the end. Let's go there to Daniel chapter 11 very quickly. We don't have time to really deal with Daniel 11 in its fullness. We will deal with that uh, probably tomorrow uh, when we talk about Revelation chapter 10. But in, Reve in uh, Daniel chapter 11, um, verses 31 through verse 39 is speaking about the period of papal dominion. It's speaking about the 1260 years. But then verse 40 tells us that something happens at the time of the end. When is the time of the end? When does the time of the end begin? 1798. And uh, what event happened in 1798? That's when the papacy received its what? Deadly wound. Who gave the papacy the deadly wound? France, the king of the south, right? You, are you following me? Now notice, at that time, at the time of the end, the king of the south will attack him. Did France attack the papacy? Yes. Did it take away the civil power that the papacy had used? Yes, that's what this is referring to. At that time, the king of, uh, the, king of the south shall attack him. Is that the end? No. You read the following verses, and the king of the north recuperates from the attack, and basically he overwhelms the world. As I have noted in my notes on Daniel 11, 
this attack of the king of the south against the king of the north, by the way this is the counterfeit king of the north, okay? God is the real king of the north because his throne is in the sides of the north. This is the man of sin who sits in the temple of God on earth making people think that he is the king of the north. So as I have noted in my notes on Daniel 11, this attack of the king of the south against the king of the north is a depiction of the French Revolution. Thus the fifth trumpet, Revelation 11, 7 through 10, and Daniel 11 verse 40 are all describing the same historical event, the French Revolution. Are you understanding this point? Now, let me just read you about what locusts do. Locusts have no mercy. They finish off everything that is before them. I found this vivid description in Quito's Encyclopedia, volume 2, page 263. Locusts seem to devour not so much from a ravenous appetite as from a rage for destroying. <laughs> I say, you know, they're, they're not going to say, well, you know, let, let's eat all the leaves because we're hungry. No, it's a rage for destroying. Destruction, therefore, and not food is the chief impulse of their devastations, and in this and in this consists their utility. They are in fact omnivorous. What does omnivorous mean? They will eat anything and everything. The most poisonous plants are indifferent to them. They will prey even upon the crowfoot, whose causticity burns even the hides of beasts. They simply consume everything without predilection vegetable matter, linens, woolens, silk, leather. And Pliny does not exaggerate when he says, Fores quoque tectorum, which means even the doors of houses, for they have been known to consume the very varnish of furniture. They reduce everything indiscriminately to shreds, which become manure. Does that uh, give you a picture of the French Revolution? Why they're compared with locusts? Notice in, that Exodus describes the devastating destruction caused by the locusts in Egypt. Uh, you know, this corroborates what we just read from uh, this uh, encyclopedia. For they covered the face of the whole earth, so that the land was what? Darkened. And they ate every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. So there remained nothing green on the trees or on the plants of the field throughout all the land of Egypt. A fit description of what happened in the French Revolution when Satan and his angels were released to do their work. Now Revelation 9 verse 12 tells us that this cloud of locusts had a king who led them. And what was the name of the king? In Hebrew, Abaddon, and in Greek, Apollyon. Now, normal locusts, according to those who have studied locusts, have no king over them. In fact, the Bible tells us that. Notice Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 27. Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 27. That shows that these locusts are not literal locusts. These are, these are weird locusts. Notice uh, Proverbs chapter 30 and verse 27. Chapter 30 and verse 27 says, The locusts have no what? No king, yet they all advance in ranks. <laughs> so they, they're very organized, right? But not because they have a king. So locusts have no king over them. So these must be what? Unusual and supernatural locusts. Now we're going, to, we're going to skip the next two pages. You can read this at your leisure. Let's just read the paragraph at the top of page 172. Some interpreters have seen in this plague of locusts 
a depiction of the devastations caused by Mohammed and the Muslims in Arabia. However, in his commentary on the book of Revelation, Seiss, Joseph Seiss, who wrote an entire commentary on Revelation, he's not an Adventist, but this is, this is very good, provides a multiplicity of reasons why this interpretation cannot be accurate. So you need to read those two pages to see why uh, this particular trumpet does not apply to Mohammed and the Muslims in Arabia. So let's go to page 174 because time does fly by. The Old Testament uses locusts to describe God's judgments against people who are in rebellion against Him. Was France in rebellion against God? Yes. Yeah, so God sent locusts as a punishment for their rebellion against Him. These locusts make a raging noise like fire. Have you ever heard locusts doing their work? It sounds like the vegetation is burning. That's why you have this, the metaphor of fire here as well. These locusts make a raging noise like fire because they come from the abyss where the fire is. They look like what? Like horses ready for battle. So, so these locusts, they're going to come on to France and what are they going to do? They're going to totally devastate it, spiritually speaking. And they devour like what? Like lions. Have mercy. Who is represented by a scorpion in the Bible? Satan and his angels. We're going to notice that in a few moments. Who is represented as a lion? Not only Satan, but also his angels. We're going to notice that. So, these locusts make a raging noise like fire. And they look like horses ready for battle, and they devour like lions. This bizarre symbolism describes the almost absolute destructive power of whom? Of Satan and his angels in France during the French Revolution. These locusts, locusts are clearly what? Symbolic. Because they are a hybrid combination of locust and scorpion. And they don't attack vegetation, they attack people, <laughs> not plants. So obviously these locusts, we're not to look for a certain place where suddenly from the deep come all of these locusts out. No, these are supernatural locusts, they have no king. Furthermore, uh, they're a hybrid combination, they're not only locusts, they have the characteristics of scorpions and lions. So it continues saying here, according to... Um, and they attack people, not plants. According to Jesus, the scorpion represents whom? Satan. Satan and his angels, I might say. Let's go to Luke chapter 10, verses 18 and 19. Luke chapter 10, verses 18 and 19. See, we allow the Bible to interpret itself, right? Luke, because the Holy Spirit placed in the Bible everything we need to understand the Bible. Luke 10 and verses 18 and 19. This is when the 70 returned to Jesus and they had the power to cast out demons. They say, even the demons obey us. And now notice, it says in verse 17, then the 70 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. And by the way, Ellen White comments that this, de this looks at the whole sweep of Satan's fall from heaven, not only originally, but also at the cross, till the very end of time when he's destroyed. Verse 19, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on what? Serpents and scorpions. And over all the power of the enemy, who's the enemy? Satan and his angels, not as scorpions, not scorpion. And nothing shall by any means, what? Hurt you. So, the most dangerous part of a scorpion is what? Its tail. And what does the tail represent? The tail represents lies. You say, what? 
Well, let's go first of all to Revelation chapter 12. Isn't that nice to interpret the Bible by using the Bible? Yes. <laughs> you know, it makes study very simple and very easy. Revelation chapter 12, and let's read verse 9. 12 and verse 9. Um, actually, not verse 9. We'll re read verse 9 in a moment. Let's read verse 3. And behold, another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven diadems in his head, on his heads. And what is it that drew a third of the stars of heaven? A third of... Oh, and his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. What do the stars represent here? Verse 9. It says, So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. So what was it that Satan used to take all of the angels with him, or the third of the angels, the ones that he took? His tail. Now what does the tail represent? Well, let's let the Bible interpret itself. Go with me to Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 15. Isaiah 9 and verse 15. It says here, The elder and honorable, he is the head. So, uh, the elder and the honorable, that's the head. Now listen to this carefully. The prophet who teaches lies, he is the tail. So what is the tail that drew a third of the, of the angels of heaven? His lies. Now, in order to understand this more fully, we need to go also to the book of Ezekiel. Go with me to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. Did Jesus say that the devil is a liar from the beginning? Yes. John chapter 8. He says there's no truth in him. He's a liar from the beginning. So how did the Satan draw the, a third of the angels? With his tail, which means with his what? With his lies. That's right. So notice Ezekiel chapter 28. Uh, this is a description of uh, this majestic being, Lucifer, the covering cherub. And we are going to read verses 17 and 18. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze upon you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore I brought fire from your midst and it devoured you. That word trading is very interesting. The root of the word has to do with a commercial transaction. So what did Lucifer do? He traded. He sold. What did he sell? He sold lies. Have you ever heard the expression, I don't buy that. <laughs> you can't sell me that one. <laughs> so what is Satan selling? Lies. By the way, the same root of this word is used in the book of Leviticus. Chapter 19, verse 16. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 16. The same root word is used there. It says there in Leviticus 19, verse 16, God is warning the Israelites, you shall not go about as a talebearer. That's the same root word. So what was Satan selling to the, to the angels in heaven? His lies. His tail draws a third of the angels with his lies. And then it says, Nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. Notice also Ezekiel chapter 22. Ezekiel chapter 22. And uh, we'll read verse uh, 9. Where the same root word is used. Uh, chapter 22 and verse 9. It says, In you, speaking about Tyre, In you are men who what? Slander to cause bloodshed. The word slander there is the same root word. So what did the devil do? He was a talebearer. He was a slanderer. He was a liar from the beginning. He lied to the angels, and that's what led him to what? 
to take all of the third of the angels, which is nearer to half according to the spirit of prophecy, from heaven and stole them from the Lord. So, in brief, middle of page 174, this army has all the biblical characteristics that apply to Satan and his angels, scorpions, serpents, lions, locusts, sulfur, bottomless pit. All of those in Revelation are related to Satan and his angels. Now let's go to, so must there be a special manifestation of satanic power during the fifth trumpet? Absolutely. Now let's notice the comments on Revelation 9 verse 4. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing. Now is this kind of weird? What do locusts eat? They eat vegetation, folks. That's their main course. And then they have the varnish off doors for dessert. <laughs> so anyway, uh, you know, it says, don't harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree. But, ah, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. So what does the green thing, the green grass, and the tree represent here? It represents those who have the what? Seal. Those who have the seal. Are you with me or not? In this case, the tree represents the righteous. By the way, are God's people compared to trees? Let's read a couple of statements. Psalm 1, verses 1 to 3. You probably, many of you probably have this memorized. Psalm 1 and verses 1 to 3 speaks about a tree, comparing the righteous to a tree. It says there in Psalm 1, verse 1, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. That's a righteous person, right? He shall be like a what? like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper in his hand. Are you following me? Let's notice also the uh, Psalm seven, uh, 92 and verse 12, being that we're in Psalms, Psalm 92 and verse 12. Uh, it says there in Psalm 92 and verse 12, once again, once again, comparing a righteous person with a tree, the following. Psalm 92 and verse 12 says, The righteous shall flourish like a what? Like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. So these locusts, they are not given permission to touch those who are faithful. They are given permission only to afflict whom? Those who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. Now the question is, how can the fifth seal be speaking about the seal on the forehead, the fifth trumpet speak about the seal on the forehead, if the sealing doesn't take place until the sixth trumpet? Because we're going to see the sealing on the forehead takes place under the sixth trumpet. So there appears to be a discrepancy. The question was asked here about that. Well, the fact is that the Bible and the Spirit of Prophecy tell us that when a person accepts Jesus Christ as Savior, they receive a seal. It's the gospel seal. It's not the end time seal that will seal the 144,000 living saints that will go through the time of trouble. That is a final seal of protection. But there's another seal that people receive when they accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Let's read some verses. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, and we'll read verses 13 and 14. We'll let the Bible speak first. Ephesians chapter 1, and verses uh, 13 and 14. Here the Apostle Paul wrote, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were what? You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So were the Ephesians sealed when they received Jesus Christ? Absolutely. 
Notice, being that we're in the writings of Paul, chapter 4 and verse 30. Ephesians 4 and verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were what? Sealed for the day of redemption. Notice also uh, 2 Corinthians 1 verse 22. 2 Corinthians chapter uh, 1 and verse 22. Once again, there's a gospel seal. It says there in verse 22, let's read 21 for the context, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has what? Sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. So do believers receive a seal when they accept Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? Absolutely. That's the seal that is being described here. Those who are true believers in Jesus. Now, Ellen White also measures in. Ellen White, um, in uh, Selected Messages, Volume 2, page 263, referred to a sister Hastings who died in 1850. It wasn't her husband, it was her. She died in 1850. And Ellen White comforted, uh, comforted him, or her rather, uh, by saying in 1850 that, this, uh, that um, Brother Hastings was sealed. So, um, sealed how? Is she alive now? So uh, is she going to receive the seal of Revelation chapter 7? No. But Ellen White said she was sealed. And that uh, at the resurrection she would resurrect and be among the saved. So uh, even Ellen White states that there is a gospel seal and there is an end time seal. Now she also wrote the following in six manuscript releases, page 28. Those who thus unite with the church by baptism are what? Are sealed as men and women who have been born again of water and of the Spirit. They have entered upon a new life. So we not, need not to confuse the gospel seal with the final eschatological or end time seal. Now let's go to Revelation 9 and verse 5. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. Now here's an interesting detail. Scorpions rarely kill human beings when they sting them. But they do cause excruciating pain by the poison, swelling, suffering, even to the point of peeping, people wanting to die. Applying the year-day principle, the five months would be equivalent to 150 years. Notably, the age of reason, have you heard of the age of reason? Or the enlightenment? Began in the early 17th century with the work of an individual called René Descartes. What, what country was René Descartes from? France, that's right. Uh, a contemporary of his, Blaise Pascal, wrote the following about uh, René Descartes, the rationalist. I cannot forgive Descartes. In all his philosophy, he did his best to dispense with God. Is that atheism? But he could not avoid making him set the world in motion with a flip of his thumb. After that, he had no more use for God or for miracles or for anything supernatural. Descartes' most famous book was called A Discourse on Method, published in 1637 some 150 years before the beginning of the French Revolution. The age of reason jettisoned the need for faith and the miraculous in religion. It supplanted faith in God with faith in human wisdom. During this period, the sciences 
would come to believe that all could be resolved through human ingenuity without the need of an ever interfering God. Notably, these philosophies would not kill people, but they would make them what? Existentially miserable. The age of reason inspired the French Revolution. Now let's go to the next verse which is connected with the concept of verse 5. In those days men will seek what? Death. Death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. Is that what happens with a person who doesn't believe in God, someone who has no hope for the future, no reason to live? Absolutely. Notice this statement from Ellen White that I read before. I think I read it this morning. Atheism can shed no ray of light into where? Into the grave. It cannot restrain crime or quicken the moral energies. It has no power to elevate the character or purify the soul. On the contrary, it always tends to degenerate the human race. Is that what happened in France? Yes. It leads away from purity and peace. An instance of this is given in the history of the French Revolution. Now she's going to apply this to the French Revolution. That period when the existence of God was denied and His commandments were abol abolished was the most revolting that is recorded on the pages of human history. The main characteristic of contemporary society is meaninglessness. Do you know that suicide has greatly increased yes. in recent years? Yes. Why? Because life has no meaning for people. This is why people are hungering and thirsting for what? For spirituality. But they're looking for it in the wrong places. That's right. They're, working, they're looking for a reason to live. The rise of philosophies such as deism, ethical relativism, nihilism, rationalism, existentialism, evolutionism, and atheistic communism has led people to be pessimistic about the meaning of life. After all, if there is no supernatural divine beginning, what hope is there for a supernatural divine end? If there is no creator God, there is no future. And if there is no future, then life has no ultimate meaning. This is the reason why the psalmist says that the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Are you catching the picture? People wanting to die. The scorpions sting. They cause excruciating pain and suffering, spiritually speaking. Now notice this statement from uh, Ellen White. Uh, to, to, uh, I think this TDG is uh, Today with God. 339. There are many ways in which human beings can crucify the Son of God afresh and put Him to open shame. The worship of worldly business so confuses the mind that Satan stealthily approaches and insidiously gains entrance. He has many theories by which to lead astray those who will be led. The erroneous views of God that the world is entertaining are skepticism in disguise. Preparing the way for what? For atheism. By hasty words and selfish deeds, men often grieve the heart of Christ. Thus Satan works untiringly to lead them to disloyalty. As he gains control of minds, he makes upon them lasting impressions and the realities of eternity fade away. The book of Ecclesiastes is a good illustration of the spirit that inspired the French Revolution. Have you ever read Ecclesiastes? Do you know that that's one of the last books that the Jews included in the canon of Scripture? There were three books that were included last by the Jews in the, in, in the Old Testament. One was Song of Solomon. It was two, um, how would I say, uh, too graphic. <laughs> in referring to sensual love. The second book which uh, took a long time to include was Esther because the name of God is not mentioned. 
And the third book is Ecclesiastes because this appears to be an extremely pessimistic book. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. You know, you read the book, it's depressing. The question is, why is this book included in Scripture? Because Solomon is describing his life when he went astray from God. The important thing is not the pessimism of a book, but how he ends the book. <laughs> the end of the matter is this. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man, for God will bring every work into judgment. And then he counseled the youth. He says, remember thou thy creator in the days of their youth. Before the evil days come and you look back and you say, I have no joy in them. He's describing his life separated from God. And do you know that Solomon, Ellen White even said that he toyed with the idea of atheism, of becoming an atheist? Notice what we find at the top of page 177. Ecclesiastes 2, 17 and 18, and I'm reading from uh, the New International Version, which I think is more vivid. Solomon says, so I hated what? Did he want to die? <laughs> yes. Was he suffering? You better. In fact, Ellen White said that he became effeminate. What does effeminate mean? He, be, he became woman-like. <laughs> now that's not a bad thing, unless you're a man. <laughs> it's good for women to be effeminate. It's not good for men. So he says, So I hated life, because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All, all of it is what? <laughs> Meaninglessness and chasing after the wind. Have you ever tried to grab the wind? And then in verse 18 he says, I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. That is the life of the atheist. The life of the person who has gone astray from God. That is the spirit of, of this French revolution. Ellen White wrote in Prophets and Kings, page 58, about Solomon. His faith in the living God was supplanted by atheistic doubts. Unbelief marred his what? His happiness. Weakened his principles and degraded his life. Does that sound like what happened to the people who were participated in the French Revolution? Absolutely. A good illustration of this is Ernest Hemingway who spent a good share of his life in Cuba. A miserable man. Drunk a good share of the time. Nobel Prize winner for literature in the year 1954 because of the book that he wrote, The Old Man and the Sea. It's a depressing story. Man, you read that, it's depressing. You know, this fisherman has gone out, you know, he's old, he's over the hill, and he's gone out fishing, and he can't catch anything anymore. And so his friends are making fun of him. And so one day he goes out, and he catches this huge marlin. And wow, he says, now I'm going to take it back to the shore, and I'm going to show that uh, life still has meaning. And so when he's on his way back, the sharks attack, because he's put, he's put this huge fish such as nobody has ever seen before next to his boat and the sharks attack. To make a long story short, by the time that uh, he gets to the shore, all he has to show is a skeleton. That is a symbolic depiction of his life. Do you know how Ernest Hemingway died? In 1961 he took out a revolver and shot himself in the head. By the way, do you know that Ernest Hemingway was a great student of the book of Ecclesiastes? He wrote a work which has not been published. The title of the work is The Sun Also Rises, which is a phrase that appears in the book of Ecclesiastes. 
He was fascinated by Ecclesiastes because he could see in it a reflection of his own life. And at the end, life had no meaning, so he committed suicide. Are you with me? That's the spirit of the French Revolution. That's what the world is reaping today. Now, let's read the statements here in the middle of page 177. Have you ever heard of Hume the philosopher? It is said that Hume, the skeptic, was in early life a conscientious believer in the Word of God. Being connected with the debating society, he was appointed to present the arguments in favor of infidelity. Be very careful about defending what you don't believe in. He studied with earnestness and perseverance and his keen and active mind became imbued with the sophistry of skepticism. Ere long, he came to believe its delusive teachings, and his whole afterlife bore the dark impress of infidelity. Voltaire, one of the key figures in the French Revolution, we're told when Voltaire was five years old, he committed to memory an infidel poem. Infidel means faithless. And the pernicious influence was never effaced from his mind. He became one of Satan's most successful agents to lead men away from God. Thousands will rise in the judgment and charge the ruin of their souls upon the infidel Voltaire. Rationalism even came to the point of denying the story of creation. You can read the, the next uh, statement that begins at the bottom of page 177 and ends at the top of page 178 because we need to finish this particular chapter. Let's notice the comments on Revelation chapter 9 and verse 7. The shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. Where is the backdrop to this in the Bible? The backdrop of this imagery is in Joel chapter 2 and verses 4 through 10, where God compares an invading army with a plague of locusts. It is of interest, this is an interesting thing, that the Italian word for locust is cavaletta. What does cavaletta mean in Italian? Little horse. <laughs> Interesting. The, the locust is related to the horse. In fact, it, uh, in some ways it looks a little bit like a horse. And the German peasants call the locust Hupfarda, which means hay horses. At this point, Satan and his angels are already gathering their forces for what? For the final battle against, the go against God, the Bible, and His people. Their hair was like women's hair, and their teeth were like lion's teeth. They had breastplates like breastplates of iron. The sound of their wings, their flying, was like the thundering of what? Of many horses and chariots rushing into battle. Were they, were they ready to go to France and do their work? Yes. They had tails and stings like scorpions, and in their tails they had what? power to torment people for five months. So let me ask you, are their lies a torment to people? The doctrines of the French Revolution, absolutely. Now what does a lion represent? It says here that they had lion's teeth. What does a lion represent in the Bible? Well, it can represent Christ, it can represent Babylon, it can represent Judah, the, the son of Jacob, but it can also represent whom? Satan, who goes forth as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. But his angels also are compared with lions. Notice this statement from early writings, page 191. Satan, this is after Jesus gained the victory over Satan, ascended to heaven. Satan related to his angels that Jesus had given his disciples power to rebuke them and cast them out, and to heal those whom they should afflict. Then Satan's angels went forth like what? Like roaring lions seeking to destroy the followers of Jesus. 
in Scripture, as I mentioned, the tail represents lies. It is significant that during the 1260 years, Satan deceived people by the lie of what? False religion. But during the age of reason, Satan deceived and hurt people by the lies of what? Secularism or atheism. And here comes the interesting part. You know, let me ask you, who are going to be the greatest enemies of God's people, the liberals or the conservatives? <laughs> well, it all depends whether you support Joe Biden or Donald Trump. <laughs> no, actually, who were the liberals in Christ's day? The liberals were the Sadducees. Who were the staunch conservatives? The Pharisees. They hated each other. And they had different doctrines. But when it came to destroying public enemy number one, they joined forces. So let's not get politically involved and say, you know, they, oh, we need to side with the conservatives or we need to side with the liberals. You know, because the Bible tells us that the king of the south and the king of the north will join forces to persecute God's people. Final comment, Revelation 9 verse 11. The king who rules over the locusts is the angel of the abyss. Who, who is identified in the Bible with the abyss? Satan. In Revelation chapter 20, right? He's put in the abyss or the bottomless pit as it's mistranslated. So the king who rules over the locusts, over this army that is going to unleash on France in the fifth trumpet, his name is in Hebrew, Abaddon, and in Greek, the equivalent Greek word is Apollyon. The names Abaddon and Apollyon means what? Destroyer. The destroyer. Is that exactly what happened in the French Revolution? Yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. The New Testament describes Satan as the ruler or prince of demons. Isn't that true? So who is the leader of this host? Satan. Satan. And Jesus referred to him as the what? As the destroyer in John 10 and verse 10, which is the verse with which we will end our study this afternoon. John 10 and verse 10, Jesus said the following, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to what? And to destroy. But Jesus came what? I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Tomorrow we will study the interlude of Revelation 11. And then maybe tomorrow we'll study Revelation 10, which is also part of the interlude.